Hi there. So, like Nick just said, I'm Chang Lin. Work at Bridgewater Associates, just like Jason earlier today. Work in a different unit. I'm not going to get too much into that. If you want to know more about what I do, go ahead, look at my bio, look at the TED Talk in there. Everything may be a little bit more clear. I don't know. Anyway, do that and things will be good. So, title of this talk is Moving Beyond Defensive Programming. All right, and let's start a timer to make sure that I don't screw myself over. Great. So what does this talk about? This talk at its core is about using types to solve many of the same problems that classic defensive programming techniques try to solve, but hopefully a little bit better. Given that this is a lightning talk, it's going to be a pretty quick and brief introduction. So in many ways, it's just a sort of springboard from which to do your own explorations that I'll link to at the end. But hopefully there's some techniques in here that if you're new to Scala, are good guidelines to abide by. And if you're experienced, might be a good vocabulary that you can use with your team when talking with them. All right, so before I dive into the talk, I'm gonna talk about some of the assumptions that I'm making about your code base when I'm giving these sort of guidelines. And the first one is I'm gonna assume that your code base contains a lot more data processing code than it does algorithmic code. And what do I mean by that? Well, algorithmic code is code that's trying to implement some sort of mathematical formula or trying to implement some basic CS algorithm. And while a lot of code bases are that, I'd wager that for most people in industry, a lot of the code base is not that. It's going to be data processing, going to be taking chunks of data, changing its structure, recombining with other data, and persisting it out somewhere, or reading from persistence somewhere. The other assumption I'm going to make is that a lot of the code is going to be internal, either application code or internal library code. Some of the guidelines I'm going to give might change a little bit if you're developing some sort of external library that's meant to be used in Maven in conjunction with the rest of the Scala ecosystem by thousands of other users. And depending on how much time we have, I'll go into what that means for some of the things I say during the Q&A session. Cool. So before we get into sort of types, defensive programming, whatever, what does it even mean for code to be correct? And in particular, what does it mean for data processing code to be correct? It's quite straightforward. Data processing usually consists of some pipeline. You've got a bunch of different processing steps. You need to make sure that you get all the steps in the right order. You've got to make sure that you get all of them. You don't leave any of them out. You don't put too many in. And that you handle all your edge cases. That's kind of a long laundry list. Another way of thinking about, another lens to look at it, is through the lens of post and preconditions. That is that you can imagine each data processing step has a certain preconditions that it imposes on the data that it expects to see. And after passing through that step, in turn imposes its own set of post conditions that maybe other data or other code or other data structures downstream take advantage of. Okay? And you've got to make sure that the combination of all your steps preserve this nice matching between the preconditions and the post conditions. That your post conditions from a function feed into the preconditions of another one that expect it and that harmonize. And so the central thesis of my talk is going to be that types can serve as machine-checked labels for these conditions. And I use the word label here very carefully. I don't use the word encode, and I'll get into why I don't. And of course, also some rule of, rules of thumb to make sure that you're fully utilizing these types as labels. Okay, so here's an example. What do I mean when I say sort of types as labels or perhaps the negative example? What happens when you don't do it? Here's an example of something that you might find, a simplified version of a CRUD API. It's create part. You take user input, which is a string, you sanitize it, properly capitalize it, whatever, generate a database record, persist that database record out somewhere, all right? And imagine you're a new developer or an old developer trying to reuse this code that already exists in your code base. Maybe it's scattered across a bunch of different modules, and you need to make a new pipeline using these constituent parts. Well, here's a simple way of doing it, and the compiler won't yell at us. You read from user input, and you properly capitalize it, generate a database record, and persist it. And of course, app security from earlier today, you're not sanitizing anything. What happened to sanitization? Well, if we take sort of a book, a page out of the uh, defensive programming playbook, just always sanitize right before you hit the database, right before you generate that database record. Just always, you know, make sure you got to sanitize because you can't trust what input it, your, the input to your function is, and certainly you can't trust input to your program outside your function. But does that work? I mean, are you supposed to capitalize and then sanitize? Maybe sanitization screws up your capitalization in weird ways and you end up with all sorts of those weird percent signs or something like that. Maybe you're supposed to sanitize, then capitalize, but maybe if you do that, you introduce an edge case that somehow screws up your sanitization. Maybe some sort of invalid data that used to be sanitized is no longer sanitized once you capitalize it. Maybe, if you want to be extra conservative, just sanitize, then capitalize, then sanitize again. Just keep on going. Be as defensive as your heart allows. 
And a lot more fun things will happen if your API gets bigger. This is just, what is it, five, six functions? Your API, your actual data processing, your code base is not five or six functions. It's gonna be a lot more than that. And you're gonna have a lot more of these problems. And what sort of it boils down to, that why this is a problem in a lot of code bases that rely purely on classical defensive programming techniques is that at their heart, classic defensive programming techniques are conservative. They try to, they don't assume anything about the input and try to check various things. If they can transform it into a more amenable form, they'll try, otherwise they'll fail early. But the crucial thing that doesn't happen is that they generally, if you look at sort of defensive programming in Java or in a lot of other mainstream O languages, they don't signal to downstream code that a post condition holds after they've done validation or after they've done a certain transformation. And what does that lead to? That leads to checks everywhere. And on the one hand, redundant checks. Whatever, runtime hit, nah, it's not too big. But the bigger problem is you end up with this weird phenomenon of cargo culting, a ton of these checks all over the place. Because you don't know where your function's gonna be called, so you're just gonna do your best to try to make sure that you capture everything that could go wrong. And if you do that, all of a sudden, now you have to keep all of that in your mind. You're basically moving the entire institutional knowledge of your dev team of what checks need to be made onto yourself every time you're processing any data input. You mess it up, or maybe it's no longer necessary after refactor, you're never gonna know. You end up with this weird cargo culting phenomenon, and that's sort of the big, big loss. Like if you think of just Java code, how many times do you do a null pointer exception check? Do you really need to do it all those many times? Probably not. And so how can types you know, help you at least? Maybe they won't completely solve it, but at least they can help. Well, the crucial thing you can do is label these conditions as having been performed so that you can then use it downstream. And you just need to label it. You don't need to try to encode it. Because Scala's type system, sometimes it's easy to encode certain invariants in the types. Sometimes it's hard. Is it going to be easy to encode exactly what a sanitized string means in the Scala type system? Probably not. Can you do it for like a sorted list? Maybe, but even then you're getting into questions of is this gonna kill my compile times? Is this gonna make my code less maintainable? Instead, you can just make these labels and then constrain how you enter this label. And then that way you know that as long as this label exists in your code, whatever validation need to be done to generate that label has occurred somewhere. Okay? And then you provide an escape hash to remove that mark, remove that label, to go back to an underlying raw type so that other code that doesn't require a stringent precondition can still use it. And here's one basic example. Um, like I said, at the end I'll run through some more advanced techniques that, might, that you might wanna turn to, but this is an example that works straight out of the box, value classes. That is, you take some underlying raw type that's far more general than what you need, and you just say sanitized string. Now sanitized string, once again, it's just a label. It's just a name that you've given a human readable name. The compiler doesn't know what it means to be a sanitized string, other than the only way you can get it is through sanitized string, that function there, that method, right? And so all of a sudden now, you gain this ability to say, hey, anywhere that I see the sanitized string, whether I put it in data structure, whether it's coming from data structure or another function, I know it's already sanitized, and I don't have to worry about that concern again. And now if you take this sort of idea and think about what the ramifications are, you get a couple of interesting guidelines out. The first one is that functions should handle their entire source type, which is really just another way of saying functions should be total. Because if functions aren't total, this is a good indication that you're not taking advantage of preconditions. There are certain preconditions in your input type that you're not capturing at the type level. Because if your function blows up on that, it's probably a sign that that's a precondition that you need to fulfill before your function can run. Right, and so the easy way you can make your function total is by always just going to an option or wrapping the exception either or maybe making your own algebraic data type of, of uh, an exception higher or an error hierarchy or whatever. And that's fine, but that's a consolation prize. You only do that if you can't do a stricter source type that might let you remove option either altogether. So what do I mean? Let's take a look at an example. Generate database record, right? Your first pass might be just take an arbitrary string, turn it into a database record, but you probably can't take arbitrary strings, right? Usually they have to be formatted some way in order for sys to some, in order to generate some sort of record from it. So make it total. Make sure that at the very least we can handle our edge cases, right? Thinking back to what makes a data processing pipeline correct, handle edge cases. So we can wrap it in either, either invalid string or database record. But this still isn't really capturing the spirit of the precondition. We've moved a precondition from the pre part to the post part to the output. And in fact, if we just move it to the input type, we just say it has to be a properly capitalized string, right, or whatever that invariant needs to be, then all of a sudden we've removed the either, we don't have to do a nasty flat map, which really isn't that nasty, but hey, it's additional syntax. 
And crucially, we've signaled in a human readable way that's also compiler checked institutional knowledge about what checks need to be performed. So that's preconditions. What about the other side? Well, another interesting sort of consequence of this idea of taking types to label conditions is that functions should probably also occupy their entire target type, their entire destination type. If we look at this example, we've got uppercase, and a very sort of sensible first pass at a type signature for uppercase is string to string. After all, you take a string, you generate a new string, it's just got uppercase things. But if you think about it, that second string, that output string is a little bit too general. There's certain strings that uppercase is never going to generate. It's never going to generate a string with lowercase letters in it. Right? That's just part of what it does. And if you just say that generates a string, nothing downstream can take advantage of that post condition. Right? You could imagine sort of making a, a case class that has a field that's called uppercase string or something like that. And so if you just specify that in the output type, if you make sure that the function can always hit every value in its output type, then you've made sure that your post condition is something that's useful for downstream code to use in their own preconditions. Okay? Another word for this is surjectivity or onto. And so the mantra, if you remember nothing else from this talk, is make sure your functions are total and surjective. You've probably always heard the first part. Remember the second part, too. That has an interesting corollary. If you see functions in your code base that are A to A, the same input type and output type, you should think hard about whether it really should have that type. Because if we think back to what this means, you know, if you think of types as labels, then this means that this is a function that doesn't impose any additional conditions, any additional validation, any additional structure on what passes through it. Now, that's not impossible to see. You'll see that a lot in math functions or whatever, adding one to a number doesn't really impose any additional structure to it, but it's pretty rare, and it's even rare in the data processing pipeline. So be careful if you see that sort of type signature. Right? Don't do string to string. Make it a little bit more descriptive. And so if we go back to the first example I gave of a very simple CRUD API, and we just sort of give it more sensible type signatures, don't worry, you don't have to memorize these, I will comment them on the next slide, it's immediately apparent, hey, this doesn't work, right? Because if you have a string when you read from the user input, but properly capitalizing string requires that sanitized first. And even though the first time you've written this, you might not have this knowledge, you've moved this institutional knowledge so everyone else after you knows what the right order is. That they just need to switch it around, and they get that. Okay, so what have we gained? We've removed redundant checks. Everything downstream doesn't need to know about sanitized string. We can reuse other code with less fear. If someone makes some other person in the code base makes a function that generates a sanitized string, you can now use it without having to worry about whether it's sanitized or not. Right? You don't have to keep all the checks you need to do in your mind. You just need to make sure the labels all line up. Making little pieces sort of fiddle together and playing jigsaw puzzle is a lot easier than making sure you keep all the invariants of your code base in your mind at all times. And finally, the classic refrain, turn runtime errors into compiler errors. All right, so here's the conclusion. Simple usage of types as labels, once again, labels not necessarily encodings, of pre and post conditions can ensure the integrity of your data processing pipeline through refactors and additions of new features. And in particular, you can move institutional knowledge of what checks need to be performed out of developers' heads and into the type system. Cool, addendum, these are things to search in your favorite search engine. Bill Venner's Scalactic Library is going to be talking next. He's probably not going to be talking about this, but this is still a great library. You should check it out for some notion of some of the techniques here. And the crucial thing is you don't need to use any of these to get mileage. You can just use what I've just talked about, and you'll already get quite a bit. And of course, talk to me afterwards. Or email me if you want to know any more about these. All right, great. Got a couple of minutes for questions. Fantastic. And I can also have leading questions if you guys want me to talk more. Or if you guys have other questions, of course, feel free to ask. Yes. What is a phantom type? All right. Uh, I don't have that much time to explain it. The basic idea is a phantom type is a type that doesn't have any runtime representation, but exists only in the mind of the compiler. The way you usually see it implemented in Scala is that you'll see some sort of type variable. And that type variable's type doesn't correspond to any field in your class. Rather, it's just something that sits at the type, sort of the type de declaration. And by labeling it that way, sort of going back to the idea of types as labels, you can make sure types line up and in certain ways enforce certain variants there. That's the very quick level summary. Once again, if you want to know more, talk to me afterwards, email me. I'm happy to talk your ear off about this. Cool. Anything else? I can put the leading questions back up if people need ideas. 
Fantastic. All right. When should you not use these techniques? So if we go back to the sort of invariance that I was just talking, or sorry, the assumptions for this talk I was talking about, one of them was internal versus external libraries. When you're making an external library that's meant to play nice with the larger Scala ecosystem and used by a lot of people, having a proliferation of types, which is what this sort of technique often leads to, is kind of hard to get away with because you might make your notion of properly capitalized string or sanitized string. And maybe some other library somewhere else makes their own sanitized string. And now an end user that's tried to use both of those libraries has to write boilerplate code. And it's not too bad if it's two libraries, but if you have three, four, five, whatever, it starts to become a pain very rapidly. And so you need larger scale coordination that you really only get if you're all working in a single code base. That's hard to do in a distributed setting. That's one big place where you might not want to use this technique. Um, and another one sort of going back uh, is this, these, this particular technique that I've talked about, this sort of wrapper value classes, is pretty lightweight in terms of onboarding new people, what they have to learn, how, if they can read your code base. Um, some of the other things on this slide that I was talking about get a little bit trickier there. And so I promise in the description of this type that you're not going to see implicits or anything like that. Some of these start getting into pretty crazy implicits. And that becomes a real trade-off of compile times and maintainability. Cool. Anyone else can also ask another one of these. Yes, what about preconditions that involve multiple arguments? I'm glad you asked. So this is actually, it's an interesting problem. The, one example of this might be, hey, um, I'm trying to create a person uh, and I want to make sure that the ID and the name that I get both come from a single location. I'm not sort of injecting arbitrary names into it. And so one way of doing it, the simplest way, is basically you bundle all your invariants into the same class, right? So you say like, okay, these three sort of arguments to my to my function all need to have some relationship among them. Like they all need to come from the same database row potentially. So you just encode them all as a single database row class and pass that in as a parameter. Now that doesn't really scale to more complex relationships. So the other thing you can do is path dependent types. And so I have a gist which if you guys are interested in, let me know and I will actually flesh out and turn into a sort of larger comment. But the crucial thing you can do is you can sort of use path dependent types to encode relationships between things. In this case, between a person ID and a name as well as say a blacklist of people who aren't allowed to be created. And then you can just say, hey, I create a person ID, I make a certain set of relationships, and then I generate, I have a bunch of these functions that sort of can piecemeal create various proofs that certain validations have occurred and have it tied back to the specific instance of a given argument, which is usually what you want when you're talking about relationships between different arguments. So in particular, something like this doesn't compile, right? You try to look up relations for another ID, not example ID, and you say, oh yeah, oh yeah, sorry. There we go, how's that? So you try to look up the blacklist status of an incorrect person ID, you try to look up the blacklist status of another ID, and you say, yep, another ID is not blacklisted, so I'm gonna create an example ID. Path dependent types allow you to prohibit that sort of behavior, to enforce an invariant at that level. Okay. So that, the short answer is it becomes a bit trickier. And the crucial thing I want to emphasize going back to that slide that I had there is you don't have to use all these advanced things. If you get enough mileage out of just the simple stuff and you say, yep, I'm just not going to think about multiple arguments. Like, yeah, I know there's techniques out there, but I'm not willing to pay the maintainability cost. That's okay. Right, you'll get a ton of mileage even if you just make sure that first mantra of total functions that are surjective. That'll get you a lot of the way there. Okay. Cool. I'm at 18 minutes. Okay. All right. Once again.